Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. I'm your host, Michael. Uh, joining me this week is he's back. My co-host Kent is back and joining us live from Taiwan. Sean Newton, how you doing, fellas? Good, good. For those who are new to the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, the Pound for Pound Boxing Report is a live YouTube show, Google, live YouTube and Google Plus show, blog slash podcast that discusses all things boxing. Our motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When boxing is bad, we will talk about it. The bottom line is if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. Um, if you want to find information about the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, there are two main places you can go. You can go to the Pound for Pound Box Report blog page, and the link for that is p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. Let me repeat that, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. You can also go to the podcast page, p4pboxreport.podomag.com. Let me repeat that, p4pboxreport.podomag.com. On the podcast page, you can find previous episodes of the Pound for Pound Box Report podcast. On the blog page, you can find not just links to all previous episodes of the Pound for Pound Box Report podcast, you can also find articles written by yours truly on both the blog page and the podcast page. You will also have links to where to find us all over the internet, all over social media, on Google+, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, and the Twitter handle is at P4P Box Report, uh, on Podomatic, on Stitcher. We're now on Stitcher Radio. Be a friend, be a pal, be a buddy. Uh, check us out on Stitcher Radio. Just look, for, just do a search of Pound for Pound Box Report, P-O-U-N-D, the number four, P-O-U-N-D, Box Report. And um, check us out there. Uh, write us a review. Let us know what you think about the Pound for Pound Box Report and what improvements uh, we can make. Uh, we also have a Pinterest board. Uh, we also have a link where you can, the RSS feed, which you can, sub can subscribe to, as well as a link to donate your account. And the link for that to donate your account is donateyouraccount.com forward slash P4P Box Report. Let me repeat that. DonateYourAccount.com slash P4 slash P4P Box Report. And what happens is, if you donate your Twitter account, please be a friend, be a pal, be a buddy, and do that. Um, your, Twitter, your Twitter account will be able to automatically retweet any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Box Report uh, Twitter page. Uh, with that being said, with all those issues out the way, let's get the show started tonight, fellas. Um, doing a uh, recap of what went down in boxing. This past weekend, this past weekend, the headliner, of course, was the rematch between Floyd Mayweather and Marcos Maidana. Uh, went down Saturday night at MGM and Grand in Las Vegas. Uh, Mayweather winning a unanimous 12-round decision. 116-111 on two score cards, 115-112 on the third. Uh, in the first fight, as those who know, uh, Maidana gave Mayweather uh, one of the toughest fights of his career. Uh, was very physical, was very rough. Um, arguably very dirty with Mayweather, uh, gave Mayweather trouble uh, all fight long, but Mayweather found a way to pull out uh, a close decision win in the rematch. Not so close, as Mayweather um, did what I suspected he would do, uh, and that is uh, not stay so much on the ropes, um, avoided the uh, roughhouse tactics of Maidana, uh, implored his jab a little bit more through a little more punches, and um, boxed his way to a comfortable uh, decision win. Um, I'll go to you on this one, Kent. Uh, your impressions of Mayweather um, and his performance Saturday night, and um, I'll actually request that you can follow up as well, Sean. Um, even though Mayweather was impressive, uh, even though he won by comfortable margin, to me, um, I see Floyd Mayweather, and I'm seeing some signs of uh, age and of slippage on his part. Uh, your assessment of the fight, a am I wrong um, in thinking that um, Mayweather at age 37 is showing some signs of decline? Yeah, he's been showing some signs of decline in his last two or three fights. Um, I think he did what he had to do to win. He used movement. He pop shot all night. He stayed off the ropes. He used his legs. Um, and that's what he was. He had to do to win, you know. I don't. I don't think it was a very pleasing fight. Um, I don't think. I don't think you know he's exempt for you know that it was kind of a ho hum performance. Usually, that's usually his fights. Absolutely, but it was more so this time because you know he was facing a guy that he had to really control. And I just thought the refereeing kind of took away from the fight as well. I thought Kenny Bayless was was uncharacteristic characteristically bad on Saturday. I thought he, every time that Maidana got close, he would break up both him and Floyd. 
and and I just thought he ruined the flow of the fight. I understand it's a, I understand you know Maidana was very dirty in the first fight. That's what Maidana does. That's what he's always done most of his career. Um, and and I and I think that Floyd you know drilling in everybody's head that he's a dirty fighter, that he's nasty, that that he he goes above and beyond to break the rules, and he just put it in everybody's head. And I think he. You know, I think he got a referee that that sympathized with him and Kenny Bayless, and it ruined the flow of the fight. Um, Floyd did what he had to do to win, and I think he would have done that, you know, without the help of the referee. So I, I just didn't. I didn't. I, I thought the refereeing was overbearing. I thought it, it wasn't an exciting. It wasn't an exciting performance. It was a workmanlike performance. He did what he had to do to win. I had it one eighteen one oh nine. You know, we did what he had to do to, 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 you know, to secure a win, and I really can't say much more about the fight because it, it was very, you know, routine. Um, I pushed back a little bit. I wasn't at first. I was like, uh, had my issues with Kenny Bass, but in watching it a second and third time, um, I wasn't that mad at what what he did. Um, look, I didn't want to see. The look, I know Maidana is rough, but I didn't. My fear was that Maidana he would go even further um, than what he did the first time, and quite frankly, I didn't want to see that. Um, that didn't mean he didn't go dirty at all, because let's face it, in round eight, um, Maidana went Luis Suarez on Mayweather and bit him in the hand. Well, uh, no, I'm going to tell for you. Me, I wasn't too mad at what Bayless. Bayless I just want to. I just want to jump in and say, yeah, he did bite him on the hand. Okay. All right, but you know what? That was a whole bunch of acting by Floyd because that was a padded glove. It, he, he didn't feel it that much. I mean, he felt it, but it wasn't like to that extent. He didn't break any skin. He didn't break through the glove. I, it was a whole bunch of acting by Floyd. Yeah, yeah. I think, you, know, you think it was because wasn't there a mark on Mayweather's hand, a bit of a mark on Mayweather's hand no. that he showed afterwards? There was no mark yeah. on the glove. There was no mark on the glove. I, I, think, that, I think it was kind of Act. It was act, but you know what? Outside of that, I, I just felt that that Bayless did a poor job. I just think he he did everything in his power to make sure that the the fight was so clean to the point that Maidana or what whatever Maidana was wanted to do was negated completely. I I mean, it it it, it just interrupted the flow of the fight. It was kind of overbearing to me. So, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that you know that it wasn't you know the first fight you know my dad didn't bend the rules he did bend the rules, but I think it was just a little too much by the referee. But whatever. Your thoughts on the fight, Sean? You know, as far as my Dana being dirty, I mean, in the first fight, if you're being fair, Floyd fights dirty as well, and every time he did something, my Dana reacted to it. So I mean, there was back and forth between them both. And even in this fight, Bayless, you know, warned uh, Floyd about throwing an elbow. And then, literally, 10 seconds later, he threw an even bigger elbow at him and hit him in the face. And Bayless didn't say anything. He didn't stop him and say, hey, I warned you. One more time, a point. No. So after he warns him, he lets him get away with doing something flagrant one more time. And when he got bit, he was also blocking his mouth and holding him so he couldn't breathe in the clinch. So, I mean, every time my dad does something, it's in reaction to Floyd. And Floyd has always been a dirty fighter, and people have been talking about how he bumps off with his shoulder and how he uses his elbow up. These are not new tactics for him. But, above and beyond that, I mean, I think Floyd did what everyone thought he was going to do, win easier, knowing what to expect. He put a ref in place that was going to make it easier for him to dictate what he wanted, to break the action up, to break the flow so that, I mean, it wouldn't help Maidana. We know the way Maidana fights. He's a fighter that fl fights with the flow. Get his punches going, needs that sort of momentum, that sort of thing to go, whereas Floyd, he's able to adjust. He's able to dictate pace. He doesn't throw a lot of punches in a fight, so he wants the punch count down. So, I mean, having a guy like Bayless who's going to stop the action, stop the flow, let him dictate the fight is exactly what he needs because he doesn't want to throw more than or land more than 25 punches around. Whereas Maidana wants to throw over 100, knowing that he's going to land maybe 10 to 15. 
but he wants high volume. So once Bayless got in, we all know what was going to happen beforehand. We were sort of surprised that Floyd held so much and that he ran so much. And people can say, you know, movement in boxing is not running. But sometimes in that fight, Floyd was downright running. He was looking like Lara. When you don't throw punches and you just run around the ring, that's running. Boxing is when you move, throw punches, counter, which is what Floyd does and what he's been doing great the last three or four or five fights. But this one, you could see he was a little more determined to win but stay safe. And I think he did what he needed to do. And I think those PEDs he got from Ariza, boom, they gave his legs lots of energy. There we go. Slander, but slander. Any questions? <laughs> They, they said is the one pushing PEDs, and he's the one working with Ariza, so what can I assume? And, you know, people said his legs were gone, and he couldn't move the last fight, but this one, he moved quite well for 12 rounds. I mean, in the 12th round, he, like, did a marathon. So, you know, people can say what they want, but uh, if you're going to accuse a guy of one thing, then socializing with him afterwards, and then even using him in post comments, talking about how he's helping your trainers, like, learn new things. <laughs> wrapping gloves differently, doing other things. So, I mean, Floyd is associating himself with Ariza, so he can live with the consequences. Well, I'm going to leave that little uh, stuff about uh, PEDs alone because those opinions don't necessarily express. Does it mean, does it mean the opinions of the Hammer Town Box and the those opinions of Sean Newton and Sean Newton only? We don't know. We need to be confirmed on that. But let's move on. Um, Let's talk about uh, the future for me. Well, I know a lot of talk about him fighting uh, Manny Pacquiao. Afterwards, they asked Floyd that question. He basically he gave him an answer initially, like he's open to it. Um, reportedly, Bob Arum is trying to do some negotiation to make that fight happen in 2015. Personally, me, uh, I'll believe it when I see it at this point. You know, I'm kind of ho-hum because there's been so much talk about that fight for the last five years and nothing's happened. Um, show me something when they actually get in the ring and the bell's about to go off um, for round one. Um, but, and I'll go to you on this one, Sean, the, 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 the future of Mayweather. Uh, while Manny Pacquiao's name was being talked up a lot, I personally believe that the fight Ford is going to take in May 2015 is a battle with Amir Khan, uh, possibly in England. It'll be a big money fight there. Who knows? And I see you shaking your finger at me. Um, if not Manny Pacquiao, if not uh, Amir Khan, um, who do you think is uh, up next for Floyd next May? we got to find the flat-footed fighter for him. So, so who's that going to be? Who's available in top 10, 147 that's flat-footed? Uh, we know he's not going to fight Khan in England. Come on. He hasn't fought out of Vegas in like 10 years. He's not going to England. No fucking way. I mean, fighting Khan... Uh, he could have fought Khan before he fought Maidana. That's who the people voted for, but he still picked the flat-footed fighter, so why would he fight Khan now? And Khan hasn't done anything to legitimately push himself into this fight since then. But money so talks. I don't who cares if Khan has done anything? We know he hasn't done anything to deserve this kind of but fight, but money talks, the money's there. Money talks. But money talks, Michael, but he still picked Maidana over Khan the first time. And it was still a money issue then, but he still picked the flat-footed fighter that brought no money. Why didn't he fight Khan the first time? <laughs> exactly. Because it's not about money. It's about picking somebody that's an easy opponent who's flat-footed and falls into what he wants. So he's going to have to find a short-arm, flat-footed fighter. You'd think Manny would be okay, short, old, deteriorating. But, I mean, that fight's not going to happen yet. So who is he going to fight? I mean, I have to think that maybe he's going to fight Ruslin. Hey, you know, there's a good opponent for him. He just lost, so he has to beat somebody so he's competitive. Um... Maybe if you think folks forward. were down on his rematch with my daughter, think what they were what they would think of on a fight with Ruslan, who just coming off a loss with Algeria. I just don't see it. No, I'm kidding. I know I know he's not going to fight Ruslan, but I mean my point is I don't know who he's going to fight. I mean I know one of the fights he's planning on fighting is probably Quillen for the 160 pound title, a legitimate 160 title, and uh, you know and then. Before that, I don't know who he's going to fight. But maybe Sean Newton is doing a lot of trolling here. That's what he's doing. But on to you, <laughs> This is all factual. Like, tell me one thing I said that's not true. You could be factual. You could still be trolling at the same time. No, I'm just putting the facts out there, and people can can listen like they like. I mean, tell me who you think Floyd is going to fight. He's not going to fight Thurman. He's not going to fight Brooke, who's coming off an injury and not going to fight for a while. He's not going to fight Porter, who just lost. He's not going to fight Bradley, Manny, 
He's not going to fight Marquez. So that's six of the top 47 guys out there. He just fought Maidana. That's seven. So who does that leave at the bottom of that? I mean, we have Khan, but he's not going to fight him because historically it shows that he doesn't want to fight a guy who moves in boxes. But maybe he will, but I mean, I don't see it. So he leaves two guys. Who's the last two guys that are 147 pound top 10? I still think he may fight Khan. Your thoughts, Ken? So. You know what? I'm going to be very, very extremely honest with the viewers, and I'm going to say I don't care who he fights. Um, if it's not Manny Pacquiao or, or, or Bradley or somebody in the top three, I don't care who he fights because it doesn't matter because no question will ever be answered. His greatness will, will, will continue to be a soliloquy of, you know, claims by him and his big mouth. I am the best ever. Well, you know, that's that's very debatable. And Well, I don't mind him making a claim, but just because he makes the claim doesn't mean it's true. Oh, well, listen... <laughs> I'm and, not and, and, and folks should be jumping on his side talking about he is the best ever when no, no, that's my point. That he's well, 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 they're basing him being the best ever because he hasn't lost a fight. Okay? Listen, there's plenty of fighters that have gone on winning streaks. You know? Julio Cesar Chavez started his career 86 and 0. Or 89 and 0. 89 and 0. You know? Uh, Friggin' Sugar Ray Robinson went on a 70-fight winning streak, you know? He, 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 seriously, like, that doesn't define you, okay? You know, winning streaks, okay? Winning streaks are like, you know, they're great and everything, but it's who you fight. Like, Chavez is winning streaks, you know, and Robinson's winning streaks are probably better because they fought better fighters. No, oh, that's true. And 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 and, and furthermore, I mean, he, 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 people are sitting there saying, "Oh, he's forty-seven and oh, only three fights from fifty and oh. Okay, then he ties Rocky Marciano. Okay, but I'll tell you this: Rocky Marciano has a better resume than Floyd Mayweather. Hear me out. Hear me out. Especially a lot of his later fight. I mean, look, you got to understand. When you beat guys like Archie Moore and Ezra Charles and, and guys like that, those are those are Hall of Fame guys. When has Floyd beaten a Hall of Famer in his career, ever? I'm not trying to diss the man. I'm, I'm really not. I, 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 but the fact of the matter is these... You do, know, you, do know, you do know De La Hoya was recently elected into the Hall of Fame and Mosley will probably be as well. Right, but... I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that to s suggest that he has a better record than a Chavez or a, no, uh, but a, Marciano, is, a better resume, but, but I'm just saying just, just be factually the, correct here. Right, okay, he's... Be, all right, he'd be Oscar. He, Oscar's a Hall of Fame, all right. But what kind of level of a Hall of Famer is he really? I'm not going to debate that. And I and 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 you know what? If you want to, if you want to listen, I this is my opinion. I'm not hating on Floyd, okay? But Floyd has done. He has to have done done something right to get to 47 and now. But I but I could say this safely that I don't think he's fought necessarily fought the best to get to 47 and now. I don't think he's gone in there with 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 the cream of the crop and give any division to get to that. I don't think he, he hasn't. He's, you know, he's fought you know, Hall of Famers. But what really two, and and Cotto. Red, Red yeah, Drew. Cotto as well. He'll be a virtual Hall of Famer. Yeah, but I mean, as of now, the only you know Hall of Famer on his resume is Oscar. That's the only Hall of Famers on his resume. At least you could see the thing with Rocky Marciano was he has several Hall of Famers on his resume. Like I said, he has Archie Moore, Ezra Charles, 
and other guys. That they, he, I'm not saying he's, huh? Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis. He's got Hall of Famers on his resume. You granted whatever you think about those guys. Those those guys were were Hall of Famers, and they and and over all of their careers, they fought a better class of opposition. Okay, that's all I'm saying. And 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 people are gonna probably jump all over me, and I don't give a shit anymore. I don't care what people think of me, cause 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 y'all don't matter to me. All right, I have an opinion, and I don't think he, I don't think Floyd Mayweather has ever fought the cream of the crop, the truly the the the, the best fighters that he could possibly fight. Okay, and if you all want to, and any one of his fans want to think that, that's wonderful. That is wonderful, okay? You want to think that beautiful, great. I don't have to think that. I'm smarter than that, okay? I think anybody who thinks Floyd Mayweather is the best ever needs to start reading some books on the history of the sport and start learning about some of the, the all-time great fighters. And I know these people won't because, because well, just like Floyd, in fighting a legit challenge, they don't have time for that. Well... You know what? If you if you don't have time for that, and you don't have time to have a logical discussion about why Floyd is the best ever, then I don't have time for you. Simple. I'm too old for this. I've I've, I've watched this sport half my life, and I know who who what what an all time great fighter is, and it's certainly not Floyd. And that sound you heard was Ken dropping the mic. Let's move on and talk about. Uh, <laughs> let's move on and talk about uh, the undercard of this uh, rematch between Maidana and Mayweather. Uh, move on to, um, as far as I'm concerned, a pretty farcical uh, undercard overall, particularly, but, but particularly the next fight we're talking about here, um, as Leo Santa Cruz defending his uh, junior featherweight belt against Manuel Roman. Um, let's face it, Roman was a former sparring partner of Santa Cruz. Deserve, did nothing to deserve uh, a title shot, and, and, and Santa Cruz did what he had to do, uh, knocking him out in round two um, with a right hand, um, caught him dead on the chin. He went down and out, and Robert Burst uh, waved the fight off the 255 mark. Um, and I'll go to you on this one, Sean. Um, forget the fight. The fight doesn't even, even uh, deserve to be uh, mentioned any further. No real in-depth. In of analysis here because, I, like I said, it was a joke. It was a farce. Um, it sh shouldn't even have been in the ring. Uh, afterwards, um, Santa Cruz uh, called out Rigondi out, um, the kingpin of the uh, junior featherweight division. Um, and when you look at 122 pounds, you have Rigondi out. Um, you got Carl Frampton, who recently won the IBF belt. You got Scott Quigg, who also fought this weekend. Um, even though Santa Cruz called Rigondi out out, um, I, I, I still wonder if he really wants that fight. Uh, but with that being said, let's move forward and talk about the future of um, Leo Santa Cruz. Um, who do you think he should fight next? And um, where do you see him within the 122-pound landscape? Because for me, um, I look at Rigan I look at uh, Santa Cruz. I don't think he beats Rigan Dial. Rigan Dial schools and boxes his shoes off. And at this point, um, given what Crampton did last week, I seriously wonder whether uh, Santa Cruz uh, would beat uh, a, a Carl Frampton. At this point, I would make Frampton the favorite. Uh, the fight against Quigg would be a toss-up. So, the future of uh, Santa Cruz and what do you, where, where, where do you think he fares at, at, in, in the 122-pound division? I, I agree with you. I think he's top four. I mean, as far as where he ranks, I mean, that's up to be determined because he hasn't faced the top echelon guys yet. But, I mean, they're, they're making him, building him up for a big fight. And so his next fight's probably going to be against, like, a lower top ten guy, you know, a name, because he's still, get, he's still getting paid. And then after that, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be uh, surprised to see him fight Frampton. But, uh, you know, the biggest thing they have is they both have their hometown advantages and they both make money. One in California, one in in the UK. Ireland. Yeah. So we will see where they end up meeting up. But I mean, that will be a super fight between the two of them. As far as Rigo, 
well, maybe Rigo needs to fight somebody before I even rate him and even talk about him. So he can go fight somebody. I don't care who, but go fight somebody. And then Wait a minute then, now. What? You can, you, go, you said that. Come on who now. Rigo is the best in the division. Now, come on. Who is he fought? He hasn't fought anyone. He fought. That mean he could whip. He could, that mean he could whip Santa Cruz. He would box the floor. He would box Santa Cruz's shoes off. But but I can't base that on a guy that hasn't fought anyone. I mean, you know, we could say that. Say what you want about Donaire. You don't think he's nothing. But Donaire, people were critical of him, and he was on his way out of the division anyway, and his heart wasn't in it. But so, he could I mean, still fight though. Now, come on. Sure, but that was two counterpunchers. Styles make fights. He doesn't use a jab. Everybody knows Rigo fucking is a counterpuncher, and if you're going to sit there and wait for it to lead and wait for your chance to counter, what are you, how are you going to win? I mean, Donaire was not the right fight for him, even though I picked Donaire because Rigo hadn't beat anyone prior to that, and he proved me wrong, and he showed that he was great. But since then, what has he done? He's fought two 34-year-old guys that both have been inactive. Wow, I'm so impressed. Fight somebody. Make yourself relevant. Just because people talk about you doesn't make you relevant if you don't fucking stay active. Be like Stevenson, Kovalev, GGG, fight. You're right about his inactivity, but I have, I, to push, I have to push back against the, uh, the fighter that he is, the talent that he is. But Based on that alone, you know. But I didn't think he's he, not talented, but he doesn't fight. He's not active, so he's not relevant. It's but like he's still no. skilled, but he's... Sure, of course. But I mean, you can be skilled, but if you don't fight but, anyone, no one knows who the hell you are. No one is going to push for but, but 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 all I'm saying, but all I'm saying is, you're right about that. But in asse assessing how he would do against the other 122 pounders in the world, uh, he deserves to be there, even if he's not active. Even as if, if if the reason he's not been active is because of his own doing, that doesn't mean that he doesn't deserve to be uh, ranked up there with the very best in the division. Well, he is ranked. He's ranked number one. But I mean. Who's going to fight and I'm just asking guy. how, and I'm just, and the question was still, how would a Santa Cruz fare against him and the other top dogs in the division? That was the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my point with him, and I talk about Santa Cruz fighting Frampton because that's a relevant fight. Rigo is not relevant until he's active, because I mean he's not, he's locking himself out of the fights. He doesn't bring anything to the table, so they're not going to fight I him. I don't mean to jump. Fight. I don't mean like, like I, I don't mean to jump in. Okay, and. Try to like, you know. Chayo. Huh? Go go go. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and kind of like defend Rigo a little bit. He does have um, a purse bid coming up tomorrow uh, for a fight against Chris Avalos, and Chris Avalos is rated by two sanctioning bodies in their top three or four. So I mean, it's not a bad opponent, you know, per se. So I think I think we need to like see where where that goes first, and 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 and, I, and it's a good opponent, you know. I, I I am a little critical of who he fought recently. I mean, I mean, would you have picked Saad Kokia Jim for that fight? No, that would that was the last guy I would have picked. Um, the Ajbeko fight was a farce. Um, and uh, listen. You can say whatever you want about those fights. Rigo's the best at 122. Okay? That's all I'm saying. And I, and, I, and I give and I give Santa Cruz all the credit in the world for calling that man out. But <laughs> you were talking about fighting um, uh, Frampton not too long before that, and then all of a sudden he has a damn near stellar performance against Kiko Martinez, and all of a sudden you're not talking about him anymore. I wonder why that is. <laughs> um, now you want to Boom. talk about... Now you want to fight Rigo. And I see why you want to fight Rigo, because he's a little bit more inactive. Um, if you lose to him, you can always say, oh, well, he didn't throw any punches, and he, and he, and he, and he, and he just ruined... Disrupted the flow of my my, my game and and, and 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 blah 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 and say and just make excuses when he loses. I get that point, but <laughs> um, I give him credit for calling him out, though. I do, I really do, because nobody's ever called out Guillermo Rigondeaux ever. 
There's no reason to. Really when he was at the top, when people had him amongst the two or three top pound for pound fighters in the world, he wasn't calling out Rigan Diaz. Nope, but now he is. You know why? You know why? Because A, he has no promoter currently. B, he's kind of inactive. And C, he, he, he has that safe excuse he can make if he were to get schooled. That it was just a bad style and that it, he's not used to fighting guys like that, yada, yada, yada. But... I give him credit for calling out Rigondeaux, wanting to fight the best. But I think, personally, he's, he's right now, as far as I'm concerned, he's in the top four in the world as far as super weights. But I think he's going to eventually kind of bottom out in the top ten because I just don't think he's as good as, you know, the way they're presenting him. So... I think he's got skills. He's shown that he can box before. But we will see when he fights top echelon guy, and that's what we're looking for. Quake, Frampton, you know, him. Hopefully, Rigano fights this guy who is, like, legitimate top ten, stays active and pushes himself into it. Like we were saying last week, you know, if he signs with uh, the U.K. guy, maybe that's interesting because two of the top guys are in the U.K., so if he goes there... Easier logistically, whereas I mean Santa Cruz is sort of out in the states all by himself. But regardless of how it happens, let's just hope these guys get in the ring and fight each other. Brampton against Quig, next March, Wembley Stadium. Let's do it. And with that, mean we move on to the uh, other fights on this card. Look, uh, last week we talked about Miguel Vasquez and how um, he's very um, underrated um, as a champion. Um, and he defended the title against Mickey Bay. Um, Bay scoring, as far as I'm concerned, a controversial, controversial decision um, <laughs> in a fight that can only be described as boring. Um, I, when has I, I, a I, I think Miguel Vasquez fight ever been entertaining? I, 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 I think that um, the promoters, uh, Mayweather Promotions, who set this fight up, I think they was trying to. Um, troll us as boxing fans by putting this fight on. Um, when Miguel boxing Vasquez gets a bad not be on pay-per-views. He's not that type of fighter. And being Mickey Bay didn't help either by how he fought. Um, oh, look, when boxing gets the bad reputation that it get, often gets uh, because they don't put enough action in the ring it's in comparison to MMA, it's because of fights like this. Um, I guess we have to talk about this fight because it was there. It happened. It was a world oh, title fight. God. Any of you guys can chime in, but I'm done with it. I don't want to talk about it no more. Um, this was horrendous. Y'all can talk about it. Y'all can proceed. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, Mickey Bay did not win that fight. Um, Mickey Bay was just not was not the guy, you know, establishing the fight. It was it was Vasquez that was establishing the fight. You know, I think for what it's worth, Vasquez was making the cleaner shots, if you can call him cleaner. I mean, very hard to tell with all the clinching and, you know, other, you know, activity going on in the clinches. But he was landing the cleaner shots, from what I could tell. Um, Bay was kind of content on staying on the outside, try to catch him coming in with a counter. But, you know, Vasquez is odd and perky jerky type of move. It's hard to get, get a clean shot in for him, and it it was just a very it was a it was a quagmire. It was just like a very very it was a struggle. It was really a struggle. It was a um a fight that was just like it was like two guys fighting in mud for twelve rounds. And at the end of the fight, I thought Vasquez did enough to win. Um. The, the, the one scorecard that really rankles me and really angers me to no extent is the 119-109 for Mickey Bay. I'd like to ask that, ju that, that particular judge, Robert Hoyle, what the hell he was watching um, because he wasn't watching the same fight. It, it was a very close fight, and there was a lot of close rounds, a ton of close rounds that could have gone a multitude of ways. I had no problem with the two score, the other two scores, 
because it could have went either way. I, I'll be honest. I had a 117-111, but the rounds were just so difficult to score, and they were so close. Anybody could I, – I, I've seen more people – you know, I saw more people score to fight from Miguel Vasquez than they did from Mickey Bay. i just put it that way. That's how the fight was. It wasn't a pleasing fight at all, um, which reminds me why Mickey Va Miguel Vasquez is never in – any sort of remotely interesting fights because it's just his style. He, he, he's, he's a slick guy. He, he breaks the mold of traditional Mexican fighters. Um, even Mexico doesn't even know who he is, which is, which is, which is funny because most, they know most of their fighters. Um, and he's just a very, very awkward guy to fight. And he won that fight. And they took the belt from him and gave it to Mickey Bay. And let me tell you something. Mickey Bay, Mickey Bay also trolled, you know, Fight News the other day by saying he's the best lightweight in the world. No, sir. You are not the best lightweight in the world. You didn't even beat Miguel Vasquez. Listen, you're going to be beaten by Dennis Shafikov if you choose to fight him. You're going to be beaten by him. I will tell you right now, you will not last five rounds with which Terrence Crawford. Listen, at this point, even Ray Beltron would probably knock you out. Folks, even, not, folks even having the gall to mention him and Terrence Crawford should be left out of the room. Yeah, that's the funny thing. He, this Mickey Day claimed in an article he's the best 135 in the world. I have to find the article so you can all, so both of you can have a big laugh because it was hysterical. I never read such a hilarious article in my life. Um, he has the nerve to say that, despite the fact he got a, 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 a dubious decision against Miguel Vasquez, who held the belt for four years, and it didn't look like anybody was close to beating him, except if he got screwed. And you you got knocked out by John Molina. The same John Molina on the same card that got beat by Humberto Soto. You got knocked oh, out by him. You couldn't even last... The distance and and you win the decision. You got knocked out. You got caught in the last round in a fight you were dominating. Huh? I think Soto beats Bay. Oh, I think Soto would be Bay too. If Soto if Soto could make 135, but I don't think he can. But I think he yeah. I think that's that type of thing where mostly even aging fighters can beat Mickey Bay. Like a guy like Beltron and, and and other fighters in the division, he's not that good, ladies and gentlemen. He, he listen. I think you know the guy that beat Ricky Burns, Dijon Zlata Common, could beat Mickey Bay. I don't think he's that good. I I just do not. Think, I even think Ricky Burns, if he stayed at 135, could possibly have a shot of beating Mickey. He's just just not that good of a fighter. Any words that you want to add to this fight? Uh, Sean, because yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, gotta say. you know, before this fight, everybody that ever commented on knew it was going to be an ugly, boring fight. That's why there was lots of criticism towards Floyd's card because we knew the fights on it were pretty shit. A great fighter against a sparring partner, two boring fighters, and an old guy against somebody nobody knew. But to give Bay some credit, I mean, Bay Bay made Vasquez adjust, right? I mean, early on, Vasquez came out doing what he does, moving, boxing, throwing the jab, looking for the straight right hand. But because Bay's, the way he was fighting, made it very difficult for him to out-jab him. So then he started doing those sort of diving in, sort of trying to land punches and hold type of thing, which made the fight even uglier and more boring. So, I mean, it just pays some credit. I mean, he did make Vasquez adjust. But personally, I mean, I think it was a really close fight. If that one judge, Hoyle, wouldn't have gave it such a ridiculous scorecard, I mean, there wouldn't be much complaining one way or the other. I mean, I had it a draw. I, I thought it was a close fight. I didn't think anyone really did anything to win the fight. And as far as, like, I mean, it was a, a fight of two halves. You know, Vasquez early and, and Bay late. So, you know, let's just move on and hope that uh, Bay can fight somebody that will prove that he's better than he looked or beat him and take his title and and make better fights than that one. And Vasquez is just unfortunate. He signs with Al Heyman, who basically just signs him to steal his belt. And we'll see if Heyman gives him any more fights after this. 
let's quickly talk about um, Alfredo Angulo. Uh, also fought on his card, uh, long time junior middleweight, uh, moving up to 160 pounds. Uh, fought uh, James De La Rosa in a fight that many people thought he was he should win. Um, didn't turn out that way as De La Rosa basically dominated this fight. Um, out fought, out boxed Angulo. Angulo had his moments in the last two rounds, around nine, round ten. Um, but uh, the joke score, the score cards were 98, 90, 99, 89, and 99, 90, 98, 90, 96, 92, all in favor of De La Rosa. Uh, and I'll go to you on this one, um, Sean, and you can chime in on this to make this quick as possible. Uh, Angulo's career is at a real crossroads. Um, am I wrong to suggest it's, high, it's, it's, it's time for Angulo to uh, really assess his career and think about either retirement or um, if he's going to continue a fight, continue to fight, he should be fighting um, B and C level opponents because he he doesn't have him, have it in him anymore to top fight the uh, top rated fighters in the division, be it 154 or 160 pounds. Some people would say the guy he fought was B or C level opponent. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, the problem is I have to blame his promoter. I mean, he just came off two losses, and you put him in with a young boxer who people call the poor man Laura. Why would you put him in with a guy that used movement and speed and a jab and wasn't going to stand there and, and give him much of an opportunity to unload? You know, it was a stupid promotional decision. It's good if you just want to use him for his name and build up the new guy. But, I mean, if you're trying to extend his career, it was the stupidest fucking fight to set up ever. You have to give him somebody that's going to, make, that's going to engage give him an opportunity to fight, do what he does. And then I think he, he's still legitimate if he has the right style of guy in there. But if you're going to stick him in with slick boxers like the Twins or Andrade or anybody like that, well, it's pointless because we know they're going to beat him because they're just better boxers and they're slicker. And he just can't, like Ken was saying earlier, he just can't get his punches. He just can't throw the punches. He just hesitates. And by the time he throws, it's too late. I mean, maybe we can get him in there with uh, Molina, Carlos Molina. Yeah, but he has a belt. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Carlos Molina, his style and his style, they might mesh a little better. I mean, he's in there. He's an ugly fighter, but I mean, he's in there. He doesn't hit hard. It'd probably be a pretty entertaining fight. Yeah, but Molina would outwork uh, Angulo. Sure, sure, but I mean, Angulo has power, and I mean... You know, what's his face stands in the middle, so he, he, he can get hit. So at least it'll be a good fight and still keep some sort of, gives him a payday and, and builds a good fight as opposed to putting him in against a guy that's just going to make him look bad. Um, you know, quickly, can your assessment of um, Angulo following his loss to De La Rosa? I think it's over. The man, the man can't even pull the trigger anymore. Like, he, he, yeah, that's, that was what I was saying to Sean before. When you when a fighter can't pull the trigger anymore like you used to, it's time to call it a day. And listen, I'm gonna tell you what I've heard about Engel. He's nothing but a great guy, a good family man. You know, he he you know he's gotten paid good you know you know good in his career. You know he hasn't made huge money, but he's paid good money. You know, decent money. And I think he should you know I think he should hang it up. I think he you know he's got a family. You know and He's, he's a good person, and, and I would just want to see him leave with his health, first and foremost, because he's not going to be able to beat the elites. He's not going to even beat the, 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 the B-level fighters at this point. And, and I, think, I think, you know, if he sits down and he really thinks about it, he'll, he'll, he'll realize that he just is not there anymore. You know, he had a lot of tough fights in his career, you know, and, and he, he, I enjoyed watching him, you know. I mean, even when he lost, I enjoyed watching it because you knew you, what you were going to get. That was actually really sad to watch on Saturday. Um, I'll be honest with you. I think James Dale and Roser is actually a better fighter <laughs> than most people thought. And he went out there and he won the fight. And good for him. And, and he probably gets a, a shot at a Charlo or, or somebody at some point, Julian Williams or whatever. But... He, he he extends his, his his career and never fight and, and 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 that's good for him. But I think Angulo is 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 his time is up. He's he's done what he's could with his career and you know he should retire. You know he he's he has nothing to be ashamed of. You know three of his four losses are not horrible. 
Um, but just watching him was so painful on Saturday. It's just because I knew, you know, at one time he would let those shots go, and he couldn't even do that on Saturday. Um, earlier in discussing um, Santa Cruz's win over Oman, you mentioned um, future opponents, and one of the guys we mentioned was Sky Quinn. Was Quig. Well, Quig, um, he fought uh, last Saturday as well uh, in Manchester, England. Um, I'm not even going to, even though he has an interim belt, um, even though he has a belt, I should say, I'm not even going to even say he's a WBA junior featherweight champion because he's not. It's with, you know, he's an interim it. champion. Yeah, I'm not even going to give him that much credit. Just Again, like I said, with interim titles, all that is is a way for the sanctioned by, for the um, sanctioned by to collect fees. That's all that is. Um, but Quig is a very good fighter. Uh, he fought a uh, fighter by the name of Jamoy um, in Manchester, like I said before, scored a, re a three-round TKO, uh, focused on the body. Uh, the way he ended the bout was a right hand to the body, a beautiful shot uh, to put uh, Jamoy down and out. Um, and I'll go to you on this one, Ken. Look, don't talk about the fight as much because we knew he would win and he won in easy fashion. Um, let's talk about what's in the future. Um, he's right up there at the top three, four, five fighters in the world at 122 pounds. Um, the big fight over there is a fight with uh, IBF featherweight, junior featherweight champion Carl Frampton. Um, and Quig wants Frampton. He always says that's the fight he wants. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, even though there's a lot of talk about it, uh, do you really think that the fight is going to happen or is it, um, is there a way that Quig can go another route, or it's just the fact that the talk about it is just so big right now that um, there can be no other way but for Quig and Frampton to get it on? Is this a fight that has to be made? It has to be made soon it has because, to be of, made. The, it has because to be. of the enormity of the uh, suspected enormity of the event. Yeah, I think it has to be made. It comes down to money. At the end of the day, it comes down to money, but I think it has to be made. Um, I'm just going to say right off the bat that um, Quig was expected to fight somebody better, but due to um, a pullout, he ended up fighting a guy that, you know, that had already fought for a world title and was thrashed quite easily by, I believe, Yamanaka. Um, and 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 it, and it was a short notice fight. You know, he Yama knocked for him out. He did what he Yama had to do when he knocked him out. He got yeah, him. Let me chime in, Yamanaka. For those who don't know, Shizuki Yamanaka, who you're talking about, who's the current uh, WBC bantamweight champion in the world, as far as I'm concerned, is the best at 118 pounds. Will proceed. Yeah. So he he did what he had to do. He beat he beat up. Um, you know, Jamoy to the body. You know, stopped him. And I think they're just, that's the only, I think that's, the, they're, I think, Fram, if Frampton's not going to get the Santa Cruz fight, Quig and Frampton are on a collision course. And they've been on a collision course for a while, and it's going to come to a head, and I think that's the fight they have to make. It has to be made. It, ha, it has to be done. Um, and, and it, it has to be, just that's the, the, that fight has to be done. Frampton and Quig. And, and and you know what? I would put it on, personally, if you could do it, put it on the damn Frock the Gale card. You have to, it has to be made. It has to be made. There's no way around it at this point. If, if, if Frampton can't get Santa Cruz, then this is the fight he needs to have. Very, very important. It's both important for both guys' legacy, and it, it's going to clear up a lot of things. So I think that, that fight needs to happen. Um, I'll go to you on this one. Sean, logistics is the key. Location, location, location is the key. Um, there's a back and forth between both camps right now. Quig, I believe, is being promoted by Hearn, while Franklin is being handled by uh, McGuigan. Um, one, Frampton wants to fight uh, in Ireland. Uh, Quig uh, wants to fight in England. Um, there's back and forth on whether Either fighter will travel to another guy's hometown to make the fight happen. Should the fight happen, um, if both guys get enough money, they'll go anywhere and fight. Yeah, where do you think it will end up? Uh, will it be in a neutral location? And an early prediction. Uh, Wembley Stadium. 
M sixty forty five. You, you're breaking up a little bit, Sean. Could you repeat yourself? So you'll get the bigger part of the end of them. And uh, I have friends. Could you repeat yourself? You were breaking up on me a little bit there. Oh, sorry. I was saying that I think it'll be Wembley Stadium. It'll be 60-40 for Frampton as far as the cash. And I think Frampton has more tools. He can box. He can slug. He, he showed in his last win that he, he has the tools to adjust in the ring. Whereas I think Quig is a hard puncher, but I don't think he has the ability. Um, let's move on to uh, talk about a fight that were happening. Actually, um, while we were doing our show, um, one fight at heavyweight in a kind of a multiple card featuring a bunch of hot, hot, hot excuse me, up and coming prospects. Um, the heavyweight we about took place um, last Thursday um, in Las Vegas. Um, Luis Ortiz, a, a Cuban defector, um, Southpaw, a scored a round, one round TKO, um, a guy who's, let's face it, is a cruiserweight, uh, Latif Coyote. Um, Coyote, of course, better known, known for fighting, I believe it was Antonio Tarver. Um, at Cruiserweight. At Cruiserweight. Uh, your assessment of um, Ortiz, I saw some things in Ortiz that I like, um, but you guys were mentioning um, you want to see more, um, especially a step up in competition, kid. I understand that, but yet and still, you know, like Coyote, uh, tall southpaw, a good size. I think he has some skills. In spite of the limited, well, really no opposition so far. Um, I think there are things to, that, 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 that you can work with, even though he's at age 35. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a southpaw who can punch, um, but the thing is, um, with him is he hasn't really fought a, you know, he started his career pretty strongly with with some strong opposition, but recently he's kind of floundered. You know, his last couple fights was against a, uh, um, I, I, you know, old as dirt, Monty Barrett, who's you know came back for one more payday. Um, and and Coyote, who's really been a fringe, you know, prospect at at even at cruiserweight, you know, he moved up to heavyweight and he wanted a shot at Klitschko, which is a complete freaking laugh at this point. Um, now it is really bad. Um, I just think he 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 really, you know. I think he needs to step up. I want to see him in there with a top contender. You know, there's talk of him fighting Shagayev, but even then, I don't know what Shagayev can, you know, test, he show at this point to really test Ortiz. So I, I want to see him in with someone that can really take him, you know, into deep water. You know, I suggest that maybe Tony Thompson, you know, but Tony Thompson, um, I, I, I forgot that he has a, a rematch with Adlan near Solis coming up in Germany, um, so that would be that would have been a guy I would have wanted him to see him in there with. But I mean, he needs to step up, I think, into a to fight a certain class of opposition before I'm gonna say he's a he's a, a threat or a, a a potential title holder. Um, Jamal Charlo, uh, I would consider him a, a contender now. Uh, since he's world ranked at 154 pounds, he also fought on his car, um, stopping a guy by the name of Gonzalez in round seven. I just want to mention that out because that fight did happen. Uh, Andy Charles was on a virtual title shot, but I want to move beyond that and talk about a couple of prospects on 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 the same car. Um, Sean, uh, one is uh, Julian Middleweight, uh, Julian Williams out of Philadelphia, and as well as Errol Spence uh, from Texas, 2012 Olympian. Uh, Williams scored a unanimous uh, decision win over um, Eliezer Gonzalez, uh, while Spence uh, scored a uh, TKL over uh, Noel Bolanos. Talk about um, Williams and Spence. Um, for me, I watch them. I like what I see of them. Spence needs to step up in competition, of course, but Spence is, in, in particular, Williams, I think have real potential. 
here and either at 147 or 154 pounds, I think they can do serious work. I think both fighters, um, Spence has the talent, but Williams, he does a lot of subtle things. He reminds me of Frosch, not that he fights like Carl Frosch, but he does a lot of small, subtle things in there that's really effective. Um, I think both fighters have the potential to be very good and maybe even future world champions. And I know that Spence has the all obvious talent, but I think Williams could um, move further in his career uh, because of the small, subtle things that he's done. He's very solid, very underrated, in my opinion, Sean. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I think they're both two of the, the young prospects that we should keep our eyes on. I mean, I, I think Spence is a little more dynamic, and uh, I look for him to do a little more as far as, like, career-wise. But we do have to see him step up and fight somebody legitimate. Whereas Williams, Williams has fought quite a few legitimate fighters. I mean, undefeated guys, veteran workhorses that have been in with champion-level competition. So, I mean, he, he's been in there, and I think the way they're bringing him along is, is really good. You know, they're, they're giving him a lot of different styles. They're giving him different type of fighters, not just easy step-over fighters. So, I think he, he's a solid guy. I mean, I'm not sure what his upside is compared to Spence, who I think has big upside, fast, powerful, good foot movement. And, uh, he could be the top fighter out of the States in the next three years. But let's see him in with somebody... Legitimate, at least like top fifteen. Um, I'll go to you on this one, Ken. A couple of weeks back, well, actually a couple of months back, I should say, um, we had kind of a debate um, on where is the next um, American star, potential star uh, prospect is coming from, not just in the heavyweight division, but in all of boxing. Uh, you mentioned Julian Williams on the show. Uh, talk about Spence, of course, but in particularly talk about Williams. Um, since you mentioned him. And again, um, while you say, Sean, that Errol Spence is more dynamic, I like Williams again, and I, I have to reinforce this because there's a lot of little things that he does that is very that he, it is very effective. I think at this point he may be the better overall fighter. Um, and against a guy like Adrian Marcello, for instance, um, as, as, highly as, I, as high as I'm on, on the Charlo brothers, I personally don't know if the Charlo brothers will want to fight a guy like Williams. Not yet. No, no. I, I Listen, I think Julian Williams is the type of guy that he's going to have some hiccups in the road, but at the end of the day, he's gonna, he's gonna, I think he's going to be the fighter that may be more remembered, if you get what I'm saying. Um, I, I, think, I think he's the type of guy that that he doesn't he doesn't have the money like he doesn't have the, the re, they ain't really putting anything behind him and 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 I think they're more interested they're more invested in in, in the Charlos and and Spence the, the I call them the Texas trio you know um and and I think and I think those they they see more in them you know as far as natural ability skill Absolutely. See, the thing with Julian Williams, you know, J Rock, he's he's more of a, a worker horse. He's a worker bee. He, he's 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 a guy that improves with every fight. He he he's, he he doesn't have it easy. You know, he he doesn't have the one thing that can market him over. You know, he's kind of like yeah, he's kind good. Yeah, Sean in the chat just said Holyfield. Yeah, exactly. He's the type of guy that that gets constantly overlooked. But I think at the end of the day, when it's all you said, you say Holyfield, Sean. I'm saying more of like a Mike McCallum, like yeah, just like a kind of a guy that just constantly gets overlooked. Like you know what I'm saying, like overlooked. But then eventually, people give him the respect he deserves. But it may take some time. And yeah, McCallum had power, but 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 when you, I'm, the reason I mentioned McCallum because. McCallum was the guy, number one, he was avoided, but number two, he rose up through the ranks in the same era as the Leonard, the Hearns, the Duran, And was Hagler, ignored for years. And he was ignored, uh, didn't really get any real recognition um, until late. He never really got the big, big fight that he deserved. Um, but you asked the fighters that were in his era. He might have been as respected as any of those guys, as... 
as much as Hearns, as much as Durant, as much as Leonard, uh, as much as Hackler. That's what I mean by when I mention Julian Williams. He has that kind of, he's the kind of guy who's, see, when I look at Spence, as talented as he is, my fear is he may plateau at some point. As with Williams, I see him progressing steady and steady and steady, oh, progressing more and more and more as his career goes along. He may and not he's get still, the credit. And the thing with Julian Williams, people don't realize the kid's still 24 years old. Yeah, both are young. Uh, but again, he's that Mike McCallum type guy who's going to be very good all around, who may not get the recognition that, he, uh, that the other fighters may get, that the Charlo brothers may get, that Spence may get. And I'm not dismissing Spence. I think he may be a future world champion, 147 or 154. I think he's going to be damn good. I think he may be one of the faces of U.S. boxing. But Williams is because of the hidden stuff, the small things. That's what I like about him. Spence is obvious. But Williams, it's not. You really have to pay attention to guys like that. Yeah, like, do you see the thing with Julian Williams is you don't appreciate him until you actually sit there and watch, like, three or four or five of his fights. And, like, like... I didn't really think much of him after the, you know, the Alcine fight because he did, obviously, you know, he didn't finish Alcine. You know, he went to the decision with Alcine after dropping him three times. But also in that fight, in that fight, he struggled a little bit with his conditioning, and I and I and I took note of that. You know, that he was just relying too much on big shots, and and he wore himself out. But then in the next fight, his very next fight, he he, he showed, you know, against. Uh, you know, Laura, uh, Orlando Laura, he paced himself a little bit more, and he and he and he and he he let things come to him. He didn't let he didn't go out and try to be impatient. He let things come to him, and and then he did the same thing against Freddie Hernandez and and again against Michael Medina, and and, and even in this fight um, against um, Elazir Gonzalez, he showed that he can pace himself, that he he can let things come to him. He doesn't have to always go out and, and push things, and I think he's maturing as a fighter. Um, you know, you know. Um, see you later, um, Sean. Thanks for coming by. Um, while I'm yeah, still Sean, I have to check out for us. So yeah, continue on, Kent. Yeah, um, and I think the type the type of of, of fighter. Um, Williams is, I think he's going to be the type of guy that's going to have some things not go his way. Remember, McCallum had some decisions earlier on that didn't go his way like against uh, the kid in Italy, Colin by, and, 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 and he had to really work hard to get his due. And I think that's what Julian Williams is going to be. And he's, he, and he's not afraid of hard work. You can see it in his demeanor. He's a very mature guy for, for such a young, young fighter. He's, he's very mature, and he's very you know he's very perceptive and he, and he says the right things and I, I like him as a fighter and I think he he's gonna be remembered more I think he's gonna be remembered in the sense he'll be lasting you know what I'm saying like his career I think will be longer than these guys yeah. not that not that not that they're these guys are, are, are bad fighters they're not they're very very good fighters but I just don't think their shelf life is gonna be as long as Julian Williams yeah absolutely let's move on um it's starting to shut the show down. We're not going to do a real uh, fight preview because, quite frankly, there's not any significant fights or fights happening this weekend. So we're going to end the show talking about uh, maybe the trouble in Paradise, Paradise being um, made by the promotions um, as in an interview with Fight Hype. And I'll give you, Kent, kudos for uh, sending the story to me. Interview with Floyd Mayweather on Fight Hype. And in reading this article, it looks like there may be some shakeups happening um, with uh, Team Mayweather, uh, most notably, uh, between Floyd Mayweather and uh, Leonard Ellaby. Yeah, and I and and you can see the writing's been on the wall for the last several months. You know, especially with um, several of uh, you know the Floyd Mayweather promoted fighters losing, you know, fights they were expected to win, and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know issues there, and and and, and the way certain fighters have been handled. If you read the Fight Hype article. Um, I'll make sure that, that that article gets, you know, put at the bottom of the, of the of the show so everybody can take a look at that and read it. And, 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 yeah, and if you go to the Pound for Pound box Report on uh, Google and G Plus page and um, Twitter as well, uh, you can see a link uh, about the article. Yeah, and I'm going to be honest with you. I think, you know, personally, um, 
I understand why Floyd's doing it because if he has a, a business that he's trying to pr push into the future and and try to keep it going, he can't have that around. You know, he can't have slip ups like this. It it it, it makes him look bad. It makes Al Heyman look bad. Um, I'll, for what it's worth, I mean, Leonard LB did his job with Floyd for the most part. Um, he brought in Al Heyman and. But he, in the last couple of, you know, last few months, and maybe in the last few years, you've seen a kind of, a, you know, it's he's kind of being phased out slowly. And I think that I think that with 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 everything with the, the promotion maybe you know coming up in the next couple of years, um, I I think we're gonna probably see you know Richard Schaefer slowly being introduced, reintroduced into our into the boxing world and, and I think that that's kind of what this was about um, and, and, and you know what I, I you know what Leonard LB is he is who he is okay he's just a just one part of Floyd's boxing circle um, he's not he was he slowly began at one time he was a major part but now he's sort of he was slowly being phased out now it's the, the brain trust basically with, with Floyd will probably eventually be Al Heyman um, and Richard Schaefer. And I think that's where it's going to end up. And absolutely. On that note, I think we're going to uh, shut the show down. Um, I want to thank Sean Luke for joining us. And, um, yeah, we'll thank you. Having back you, know, soon. you know, we know you have to go to work. You know, it's a, you know, it's the grind. We, we, we definitely yeah. appreciate that. So yeah, thanks and, for coming by, you know, with your opinions, you know. And I understand he's joining us live. Usually, uh, for those who are watching us on the uh, G Plus YouTube show, he's joining us live from the other side of the world right now. So um, it's real job for him to join us live, and we appreciate from him for having yeah, us having yeah. him on with us. Yeah, a lot of the guys who come on, you know, they 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 join us from from other parts of the world, and 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 for the most part, they they join us late at night. And at at the end of the day, we appreciate when they come on and and and, and come through and. and Stop by on the show. Absolutely. And um, for those who want to find, um, want to get in contact with you and tell boxing and otherwise can't, let the folks know where they can find you. All right. Uh, you can reach me at facebook.com slash um, Kent dot uh, slash Kent one. Um, you, you know, if you if you have a problem with what I'm saying about Floyd, you know, you can you you definitely welcome to constructively debate me on that. And, um, but, but I want to make it very, very clear, okay? I want to make it very, very clear. I don't hate the man, all right? He's done a lot for boxing, all right? He's done running a lot of money for boxing, but the point is, at the end of the day, and I'm going to add one more thing. He's probably the one of the most gifted guys in the last 25 years, and I will not take that, ever take that away from him. But when you're not fighting the best, I'm always going to be critical of that. And, it, and and if he shuts me up in the next two fight in the next two fights he goes and fights two two great two great fighters, I won't have anything. And he goes and beats them, you know, with no pretense or drama or anything. He'll get all the credit in the world for me, he, you know. But at this point, I, I I just I'm just critical of him. And 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 you know maybe he'll prove me wrong. I I would like him to do that, and I I hope he does. Yeah, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. And, you know, look, we, this is a show of opinions. Um, we agree on some things and we disagree on some things. I mean, look, me and Sean, we disagree on um, rigging the out doing the show this evening. So it, it is what it is. Um, me and you and I, can't. we don't always agree on things, but uh, that was making the world go round. If, it, if this show was about us agreeing on everything, it would be, quite frankly, boring. Um, and for those who want to find out um, information about me, y'all know what it is. P4Pboxreport.wordpress.com. That's the blog page. P4PBoxingReport.Podomatic.com is the podcast page. Um, at P4PBoxingReport is the Twitter handle on the on the blog page and the podcast page. You find all the information about the Pound for Pound Box Report. The blog page has links to the Pound for Pound Box Report uh, podcast and YouTube show, as well as articles written by yours truly. Podcast page uh, where you find all previous episodes of the Pound for Pound Box Report. You can personally reach out to me at Brother JR on on Twitter. And I, I want to thank you, Ken, for joining us again. Join me again this week. Thanks, Sean, once again for joining us um, live from Taiwan. Uh, uh,
coming up on future episodes. I don't know when we'll be back on because, quite frankly, boxing is be, is going to be a little dry for the next couple of weeks. It's really going to start kicking into gear um, in early October. Uh, we will let you know when we will be back on with the live YouTube show as well as the podcast. Again, we thank Kent for my special uh, guest, Kent. For my co-host, Kent, for my special guest, Sean. I'm your host, Michael. This has been another episode of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. We will see you soon. Good night. Good night.